This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I'm so delighted to to be here and to uh, have your company at this event. Thank you, everybody, for coming along tonight. Um, It's been an absolute uh, privilege to be involved in this project. Uh, Initially, it was uh, Corinne who organised the the early conference and uh, invited me to, to become involved in the editing of the book so I'm really delighted to have had that opportunity um, and I'd like to, to thank all of the uh, authors of chapters who are who are here who've participated in that um, so I'm going to um, tell you about what's in the book um, but um, in a in a a way which is going to focus particularly on the theme of um, learning from the global south. Um, But before I do that, I want to go back to the the cover and just talk for a moment about the the cover of the book. So we've chosen this photo, um, which is from the... um, the first major Pride event that was held in Uganda in August 2012, um, which was actually called uh, Beach Pride Uganda because it took place just near the shores of Lake Victoria uh, in uh, the Entebbe area of of Uganda. Um, And this was organized by Kasha Jacqueline Nabagasera, who was the founder of an organization called Farouk, that's Freedom and Rome Uganda, and uh, instigated the the, um, Pride event. And Kasha has subsequently been awarded her uh, Martin Ennals Award for her activism in a context where there's a a horrendous uh, bill in the parliament of Uganda, a bill which is actually called the Anti-Homosexuality Bill. Um, this is a, a private member's bill known as the Bahati Bill after uh, the man who's, who's introduced this um, and it threatens to introduce life imprisonment for same-sex sexual acts and in fact the death penalty where for example one person is HIV positive or for uh, sexual activity with somebody below the age of consent of 18 and in other circumstances as well. So um, a truly uh, horrendous piece of legislation, truly horrendous political context in Uganda. So this is why we wanted to to bring this context to the um, attention of uh, people and you're going to be hearing more about Uganda later from Adrian Jujuko who's going to talk to us. So I want to um, to note that Kasha is uh, retiring as executive director of Farouk after 10 years of founding and leading that, that organization. She's just um, at the point of retirement. So I want to um, pay tribute to Kasha's work and her role in instigating this um, Pride event, which we, which we see on the cover of the book. And it was clearly a really inspiring event of defiance. You can uh, find more photos online um, which were published in The Advocate uh, magazine uh, in in the US. Um, And so I I think that the defiance that was shown at that event was really impressive. However, we do note on the the back cover of the book that the the event was followed by a police raid and by arrests um, although subsequently the the activists who were arrested were were released as I understand um, so I think we could say that that brings to mind the events at the Stonewall Inn in 1969 and the police raid that happened there uh, around the time of the uh, the dawn of the gay liberation movement so we can um, understand the connection that we have um, between uh, those events and and the protests that we're we're seeing here. So, if I tell you a little more about the the content of the book, 
Um, the, the book includes um, a number of thematic chapters, um, uh, beginning with a discussion of the uh, process of criminalization of uh, same-sex um, behavior through the British Empire uh, by the Honorable Michael Kirby um, QC, who's been a, a member of the eminent persons group of the, the Commonwealth looking at um, human rights issues. And we have a chapter looking at the way that LGBT, that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender issues have been, um, uh, have been dealt with in Commonwealth institutions to this point by Fred Cowell, who's with us this evening, I'm pleased to say. Um, we uh, also have a chapter that focuses particularly on religion by Kevin Ward, who is comparing um, South Africa and uh, Uganda. And there's a, a thematic chapter looking at equality, anti-discrimination law and human rights by Dimitrina Petrova, um, which it expands our understanding of what, of what human rights are and uh, how they can be interpreted in relation to the concept of equality. Um, but per perhaps the main body of the, the book is a series of national uh, studies, uh, also some chapters which are comparative, uh, looking at several states. And these are chapters by a range of ac academics and activists um, covering 16 different states. So those states are the UK, Canada, Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, South Africa, Botswana, Malawi, Uganda, Jamaica, the Bahamas, and Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, and then we conclude the book with um, the first qualitative global comparative analysis of Commonwealth states uh, by myself and, and Corinne. Um, which has an explicit focus on uh, what can be learned particularly from the global south. Um, and I think that the whole question of how transnational uh, activism and politics can learn more about the context in the global south and learn from political experience um, in the south is uh, an extremely important theme and probably the most important theme of the book. And when we're using the concept of the South, um, we're conscious of the way that that can be um, homogenizing, and we're not using it as a strictly geographical concept. We're using it as a political concept because we feel that the, the concept of the South has, has attained uh, political resonance, and it's an important concept to use while, all, while always qualifying uh, with an understanding that, um, uh, for example, Australia has a very... Uh, complex relationship to, to um, notions of, of North and South. Um, um, I think, the, uh, finally, I, I just draw attention to um, the way we're trying to open up discussion of how sexual orientation, gender identity issues in the Commonwealth need to be understood and interpreted with reference to um, concepts and political analyses of cultural racism, a uh, concept which um, has been used since the work of Franz Fanon, for example, um, with reference to ideas of Southern theory, as in the work of Raywin Connell, with reference to recent debates over ideas of sexual nationalism or homo-nationalism, a concept that's introduced by Jasbir Puar, and also with reference to the sociology of human rights, uh, which is an area that I've been working in with, with colleagues, some of whom are based here. So we're trying to open up um, not, not only the empirical analysis, but um, questions about how we analyze and think about, um, about uh, transnational um, politics in relation to sexual orientation and, and gender identity. So let's just um, reflect on the British Empire's criminalization of, of um, homosexuality um, and the, uh, the chapter, the, the piece of work that, um, that has done this above all, has, has raised this 
into um, the human rights arena and the uh, academic arena is uh, a report by Human Rights Watch um, authored by Alok Gupta with uh, Scott Long titled This Alien Legacy, The Origins of Sodomy Laws in British Colonialism. So we're reprinting an abridged version of that report as chapter three uh, of the collection. And in, in many senses, that, that piece of work is the starting point um, for much of, of what's in the book. So as that report identified um, the um, legal context in um, the United Kingdom, uh, particularly the, the offence of buggery in England and Wales from 1533 and later of gross indecency from 1885, provided the context in which um, sex offences were exported uh, through the, the British Empire. Um, it initially in the Indian Penal Code of 1860, in which Section 377 referred to unnatural offences, uh, defined as carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man, woman or animal. And in that offence there was uh, a strong f explicit focus on the idea of penetration, defining the offence. But later you have the offence of gross indecency uh, being introduced into English law and then introduced into um, law regulating the colonies, for example, in Sudan in 1899, in Malaysia and Singapore in 1938, and later in some gender neutral forms in uh, in many other states, uh, including many African states. So this, um, although not initially uh, used to prosecute sex between women, um, created the potential for prosecutions of sex between women. And what we've also seen in recent years is many states um, deciding that gender neutrality is very important and therefore deciding to extend uh, criminalization of sex between men to encompass sex between women. So this has happened in, uh, for example, Botswana, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, I think also Ma Malaysia. Um, so currently we have a context where sex between men remains criminal in 42 of the 54 Commonwealth states. And so the British Empire's legal legacy accounts for more than half of the 78 states worldwide where sex between men uh, is illegal. So the Commonwealth, um, I think it's important to note, um, clearly many here will, will be familiar with the Commonwealth but others, others not, um, with uh, clearly has a, a, a racist and an imperialist history within the British Empire um, and the British Commonwealth of Nations existing within the Empire before um, decolonization and the creation of the modern Commonwealth from 1949. And I think it's significant that um, uh, core statements of principles of the Commonwealth, notably the Singapore Declaration of 1971, uh, referred to equal rights in certain specific respects, uh, such as with respect to racism, but, um, but not uh, to the concept of human rights as such. So it's only with the Harari Commonwealth Declaration that fundamental human rights uh, become referred to in the, the, um, the central principles and, and statements of the Commonwealth. And then uh, from uh, only this year, the Commonwealth Charter, really do we see human rights being um, placed centrally in, in the declaration of, um, of uh, the Commonwealth's purposes, which include um, issues of democracy, peace and security, rule of law, gender equality, but the Commonwealth Charter fails to mention sexual orientation and gender identity as uh, categories. 
in contrast to um, a, a growing number of UN uh, statements on, on human rights from the Human Rights Council of the UN, for example. So if we look at the, the history of decriminalization, um, we can see um, the development of that um, beginning after the Wolfenden Report of 1957 in England and Wales with the uh, first decriminalization in England and Wales in, in 1967. But um, in, the, in the book and in the um, developing analysis at the end, I think we're particularly interested in the decriminalizations that have taken place in the global south. And three of these are discussed in some detail in the book, um, particularly the Bahamas in 1991, uh, South Africa in 1998, and India in 2009. So a particular uh, focus for us is what can be learnt from these decriminalizations which have happened uh, in these southern states which might assist us in understanding ongoing struggles. And we're considering this in the context of a developing transnational politics of decriminalization. So um, we have a, a, a context of um, some more long-standing organizations, notably ILGA, the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender and uh, Intersex Association, but also uh, uh, an organization like ARC International, which has been based in, in Canada uh, and more recently Geneva, um, existing from 2003. But in more recent years, we've seen the, the development of new uh, London-based transnational NGOs of different kinds. The Human Dignity Trust, uh, working transnationally um, through legal uh, activity, uh, Kaleidoscope uh, Trust, the Peter Tatchell Foundation, and Stonewall increasingly being involved in international activity. So a key uh, question uh, would be um, in the context of um, thinking about um, the global south, um, the, the processes for representation and understanding of the, of the global south um, states and um, how we can uh, resource southern movements in the context of this expansion of um, organisations that are primarily based in the north. Um, but particularly the question of, of what we can learn from southern states. So these are the three um, examples which I've, I've picked out. Um, the Bahamas, um, which in Joey Gaskin's chapter um, tends to emerge as something of a, um, an elite uh, decriminalization where a, a minister plays a, a central role in, in uh, in uh, endorsing the concept of, of privacy. So this doesn't take place in the context of a large uh, mass movement or um, uh, a large scale uh, public um, campaign. And it also tends to take place, and I think this is important, with reference to n the national constitutional right to privacy rather than through um, legal or um, political engagement with an international or global human rights discourse. So this example tends to suggest um, that empirically we can't take for granted that the um, global UN human rights system is always the origin or source of decriminalizations. Um, the South African case um, focuses on um, the development of the new constitution uh, in, in 1996 with its uh, globally groundbreaking equality clause referring explicitly to sexual orientation. And this subsequently led to um, same-sex adoption and marriage as well, uh, uniquely in, in Africa. And uh, most recently in India in 2009, although there remain uh, appeals um, to the, the Supreme Court of, of India um, in relation to this, 
Um, the Delhi High Court has, has made its famous ruling reading down section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, as Shamit Bao discusses in his chapter. How am I doing for time? 15 minutes gone. 15 minutes to go. 15 to go, okay. That's lucky. Um, okay. Um, so, what, uh, so, I'm now going to bring out a number of um, points, themes that I think we can, um, that, that emerge as uh, things we can learn from studying and uh, listening to the voices of uh, activists and movements. Uh, in uh, southern contexts. So, um, first of all, the chapters tend to suggest that for um, activists, um, decriminalisation is not always the most immediately important issue. So, as Adrian Shizuko, who's going to talk to us um, in, a, in a moment, uh, emphasizes in his chapter the, the priority for activists in Uganda has been to um, oppose and counter the anti-homosexuality bill because the situation is so um, serious and so fraught there. So decriminalization is not the immediate um, priority. Um, somewhat differently in um, Pakistan and Bangladesh, um, Shamit Baud, who uh, traveled to meet activists um, although he's based in India, um, specifically to develop work for this book, um, emphasizes that the, the laws on sexual behavior are very infrequently uh, implemented according to the activists that, that he spoke with, and that it's often um, laws regulating public behavior, including vagrancy laws, which are um, utilized by the police to harass um, uh, people um, on the streets. So the, the focus on the criminalization uh, issue shouldn't be um, overwhelming. Um, we should, we should be sensitive to these contexts and different uh, interpretations. And thirdly, the example of Trinidad and Tobago, where the NGO uh, coalition advocating for inclusion of sexual orientation um, put forward six uh, priority issues to government, and uh, its top priority was um, issues of violence and hate crime rather than um, the issue of, of decriminalization. Um, although clearly uh, they're in favor of, of decriminalization as a, as a longer term goal. So this tends to suggest that um, an exclusive uh, singular focus on the issue of decriminalization by um, perhaps uh, NGOs working transnationally can be unhelpful and that a broader focus on human rights issues and the range of different kinds of human rights issues may be more helpful um, in understanding particular contexts. And so uh, I'd suggest that it's for people themselves and groups themselves, if they are rights holders, to um, make decisions about uh, when rights are to be claimed, which which perhaps suggests that there may be different priorities about which human rights they wish to claim first in in particular contexts. Um, a second point would be that the um, the cases tend to suggest that we should avoid conflating human rights with the United Nations and with international law. So here it may be useful to refer to Kate Nash's work um, in a recent special issue of Sociology Journal where she emphasizes the need to bring the state back in in understandings of human rights. So this emerges in both the Bahamas where the national constitutional right to privacy was invoked and also in the discussion of India where um, although in our Western um, media discourse about the decriminalization in uh, India uh, has tended to emphasize the influence of 
uh, the global human rights system and the uh, Jogjakarta principles, uh, when you read the, uh, the ruling of the Delhi High Court, you find that it's actually the, um, it's four constitutional rights which are central in the, um, the ruling and the international uh, element is very um, ex extensive. There are, there are many, many references to that, but we shouldn't forget that um, the national constitutional rights are the, the starting point um, and that um, if one were working from a purely normative point of view rather than a legal process point of view, you could argue that the, uh, the argument for decriminalisation, the normative argument, could be deduced purely from the, um, the rights in the Indian constitution, even if we acknowledge that it's the, the, in legal process terms, it's connections to previous case law internationally that are used to make that, that argument. Um, okay, I'm going to skip forward. Um, a third point would be that we need to avoid narrow definitions of identity. So the book is concerned not only with sexual orientation, but also with gender identity, and this is important to us. Um, and we think that um, the Voices Against 377 Coalition in India provides a very important um, example of uh, a coalition which um, is explicitly queer. We sometimes think of, of queer uh, as a purely um, Western label, but what we find is that Voices Against 377 have um, adopted explicitly the concept queer, apparently because it precisely of its its of their interpretation of it as having potential to encompass a range of identities. So groups such as Hijraz as a, uh, a third uh, gender group, um, Kotis, uh, men who have sex with men, a category that emerged from HIV prevention discourse, as well as LGBT, um, form part of Voices Against 377. But beyond that, Voices Against 377 was, was creative in its um, inclusion of women's groups and children's rights groups in formulating a, a case for uh, decriminalization. So this tends to contrast with the um, tendency of some uh, London-based transnational NGO activity to focus uh, only on the concept of homosexuality um, and also with some of the academic literature such as the book The Lesbian and Gay Movement and the State which is a very important uh, collection um, but, but perhaps uh, slightly restrictive in its, in its framing of identities. A fourth point would be that, um, that What's apparent is that transnational activism has existed in, in various forms and hasn't been initiated with the recent uh, development of new NGOs in, in, uh, in London. So, um, for example, the uh, coalition advocating for inclusion of sexual orientation um, demonstrates that there's Caribbean regional level organising uh, which has um, taken views, for example, on how the, um, the current decriminalisation case in Belize should be approached. So it's important to be aware of these regional, that the transnational need not be conflated with the global, that the transnational is also the regional, and that there are regional networks um, which are important to, to understand. Um, Secondly, the example of ARC International, um, originally based in Canada and, and more recently also in Geneva, um, provides a very interesting and useful example of an NGO which has focused on promoting um, leadership uh, by southern states. So particularly the way that South Africa introduced the Human Rights Council resolution on human rights, sexual orientation and gender identity at the UN in 2011 um, emerged from um, 
or appears to have emerged from uh, strategizing uh, internationally. And I think uh, ARC International um, seems to be developing that kind of strategy uh, on um, building partnerships and alliances between um, northern and southern states, which can help to avoid the perception that sexual orientation and gender identity are purely uh, Western concerns or Northern concerns. Um, on the issue of uh, linkage between human rights and development aid, um, the chapter author's contributions um, strongly suggest that this linkage, uh, which uh, was suggested at one point by David Cameron and the UK government, um, uh, in their view, has been unhelpful. So Adrian Jujuko, who's going to speak to you, uh, has argued that aid conditionality statements uh, from the UK have had the unfortunate effect of being labelled racist, neo-colonial and Western and of causing the LGBTI community to be the most blamed for the cut in aid. And Ndule Mwakazungulu has uh, commented in the chapter on Malawi that such approaches are counterproductive as they evoke memories of imperial control. Uh, another point would be um, about the, the scope of the HIV AIDS issue, perhaps particularly in Africa, to act as a strategic entry point uh, into human rights. Um, so uh, in the Botswana chapter by Monica Tabengwa and Nancy Nichol, um, it's uh, noted that employment dis discrimination law in relation to sexual orientation um, developed in 2010 and the quantitative analysis in the introduction of the book also shows that this has happened in Mozambique in 2007 and in Mauritius in 2008. So um, what, what seems to have happened is that debates over employment discrimination law on HIV and AIDS and health have provided an entry point for uh, low-key parliamentary intervention, uh, which has had the effect of, of creating non-discrimination law in relation to sexual orientation. So this suggests that um, in some contexts, decriminalization may not necessarily be the first entry point into uh, human rights for activists. Um, working to put sexual orientation and gender identity on, on the agenda. On the issue of religion, um, perhaps two chapters focus on this the most. Uh, Kevin Ward's chapter on uh, Uganda is, sorry, that's actually a comparison of Uganda and <coughs> South Africa with respect to um, religion. But Kevin Ward notes that um, the influence of Pentecostal churches and uh, including uh, forms of funding from the United States have had a very negative impact. Um, but he also contrasts that with more uh, with moderation from some Anglican uh, figures. Uh, so there's a sensitivity in his analysis to the diversity of, of different um, denominations and religious views. In the Malaysia context, Shannon Shah uh, talks about the, the situation uh, for Muslims in that, in that situation and emphasizes the uh, importance of achieving a minimum acceptance, uses this word acceptance, of sexual diversity as the first step and suggest the insufficiency of human rights for this. So the emphasis there is on the work needed to use a diverse, uh, diverse Muslim discourses, diverse interpretations of Islam. And Shah says, what does help is engaging Muslim leaders and scholars in the everyday experiences of sexual minorities. So, um, 
I think the, the emphasis there seems to be on the limits of what human rights discourse can, can do and the importance of um, other cultural uh, strategies and engagements. Um, finally, the importance of alliances across struggles and the, the potential benefits of a uni unified uh, human rights and equality approach, which comes across so strongly from the South Africa uh, context. Um, so the benefits of alliances between anti-apartheid activists and LGBT movement activists before uh, the end of apartheid, which then paid off uh, uh, in terms of the uh, formation of the new constitution. So a unified human rights approach as actually having uh, many benefits for a multi-dimensional uh, intersectional um, politics. And the analysis of, of hegemony uh, seems to be uh, important um, in, in that uh, context, uh, which, so we comment that uh, South Africa shows that pro progress can occur not only through law, but through democratic politics in conditions where equality as a value is loudly proclaimed. So much, I would say that much of the existing commentary on South Africa focuses on the minutiae of how the category sexual orientation uh, got into the, the constitution and, and particularly in some of the legal literature there's perhaps what's missed is it was the broad um, emphasis on, on equality as a value in that society in the African National Congress um, which created a context in which elites within the ANC could uh, approve sexual orientation in the constitution. So it's very hard to, to draw this together and, and the main purpose of the, the book has been to, um, to enable different voices to speak. Um, so um, the analysis at the end by myself and Corinne is intended to be um, suggestive and ex uh, uh, an exploratory um, first attempt at comparative analysis in this context. But what's clear is that although the, the Commonwealth's imperial history circumscribes its potential for human rights to some, to some extent in certain ways, it also presents opportunities uh, which are important and we discuss a range of Commonwealth institutions at the, at the end of the book which provide opportunities that should be pursued. Um, I'm conscious of, of being short of time but um, so I think uh, on the one hand we, we think it's important to acknowledge the empirical evidence that decriminalisation can occur in narrow ways as in the Bahamas case but in general, we would emphasize the benefits of a, a unified uh, human rights strategy and the way that that can be helpful in uh, developing a multidimensional and intersectional politics. But above all, at the end, we are emphasizing the importance of um, North-South <coughs> alliances, which are sensitized to the power relations uh, between North and South. We think that the um, the way in which South Africa took, has taken strategic prominence in uh, some recent UN uh, resolutions is very um, important and a, and a good model of southern leadership and perhaps if that, that kind of southern leadership could be replicated in the Commonwealth uh, as it, it's been occurring in, in certain UN contexts, um, that could be a more helpful way to, to proceed in the Commonwealth. Thank you.